Good afternoon, everyone. So our next speaker, Graham Dumbleton, is the author of the Apache module um, Mod Whiskey, and he's currently the lead software engineer at New Relic Incorporated. His talk today is called How Do Debug Toolbars for Web Applications Work? Please welcome him. Um, thank you for coming. I, I don't see Simon Willison here. Yep. Oh, you are up here. I was going to invite you up here to do my talk since you've sort of now twice stolen my limelight. <laughs> okay, let's get going because I've got a lot here. Uh, so web application debug toolbars exist for various web frameworks. Uh, solutions exist for frameworks written in Python, Ruby, PHP, and Perl. I, I don't really have an idea exactly where they first originated, but for Python, I believe the first one is the Django debug toolbar. Um, but I'm sure that if, if Dylan was here this year, who, who's not, he would jump up and say, no, no, Zope had one years before. Um, but my research, I could only find one for Plone, which was um, implemented in, in, done in much more recent times. So. As to what they are, the, ap the application, the actual web application toolbar is a piece of code which gets embedded within your web application. Once enabled, when you access any web, app web page from your application and from a browser, a toolbar or sidebar will be presented along with the normal page response from your web application for the URL which was just visited. Through this toolbar, you can then access information about the specific web request which was just made. A range of information about the request may be presented, generally with separate panels selectable from the toolbar. This can include performance data, such as how long the request took to execute, the CPU resources consumed, or other operating system parameters. The request headers received by the web application from the browser, as well as the response headers that are returned, are also generally available as would details of any request parameters and cookies, plus a range of web framework specific information could also be available, such as for Django, you might have templates that are rendered, uh, signals that are, or yeah, signals uh, and so on, which might get triggered in that request and so on. So this may include session information derived also from cookies, uh, the URL route matched, and the name of the actual handler function or view handler, uh, which has processed the request. Even more detailed information about the work done within the context of a request for database queries, template rendering might also be available. For the case of Django Debug Toolbar, uh, which I've shown, been showing you in the pictures, it provides a set of quick setup instructions. First, you need to get the Django Static Files feature working for Django. After having done that, you add the Django Toolbar itself by, list, by, itself by listing, adding it to the list of installed applications in Django Settings module. You then need, also need to ensure that Django is running in debug mode. It is now just a simple matter of running the Django development server and you're all ready to go. Or at least you hope you are. In the quick setup instructions for Django debug toolbar, you'll find this nice cheery message warning you of possible impending doom. So your luck may vary, but this obviously raises the question of what is Django debug toolbar actually doing on startup that could cause such a mess? including the possibility of circular imports and errors telling you that you've configured things correct, incorrectly. The answer to this lies in the note in the documentation preceding this warning, and that is that the Django debug toolbar is using an evil little hack to bootstrap itself. Specifically, Django debug toolbar wants to monkey patch additional configuration into the Django settings module and URLs views. To do this, it is hijacking the validating of database models done when using the development server to run code, which has nothing to do with the actual database. Now, I have got wind of some changes in Django 1.7 related to application initialization, so it's possible that this may no longer apply. But what do you do if the server does blow up on you because of this? Also, since the evil workaround is dependent on using the Django development server, how can you use the Django debug toolbar with an alternate web server such as ModWiskey? For this eventuality, Django Debug Toolbar provides you with an additional explicit setup path. The first step in that is that you need to tell it in the Django settings module to not actually do that evil monkey patching. Now, we already added the Django Debug Toolbar to the list of installed applications. This is still required, otherwise Django will not know where to find the static file assets and template files that the Django Debug Toolbar view handlers require. Leave it out and you'll immediately get a template does not exist exception from your web, applica web application when accessed. Next, we need to change the Django URLs configuration. This is to insert special Django debug 
toolbar view handlers to process any requests which are received under the underscore debug sub URL of the Django application. Wisdom is that Django debug toolbar should never be used on a production system, so this is gated by checking the Django debug flag. This, of course, assumes you know why you should not be running Django in, in production with the debug flag enabled, and, and uh, Simon gave some nice warnings about that one uh, yesterday, I think it was, or today. So after adding in the URLs for the Django debug toolbar, we need to add in a middleware class. This is quite an important part of the Django debug toolbar code, and its placement in the middleware classes list is also very important. It must be placed as close to the start of the middleware class list as possible, but after any middleware that encodes the response content, such as gzip middleware. Finally, although you should only be running the Django debug toolbar in a development environment, you still need to protect who can access it. The last thing you want is someone being able to access it over the conference network while watching my talk. Now, the documentation does say that if you don't set this, it will default to 127.0.0.1 and, and the IP6 column column one. Uh, on Mac OS X, at least, I found that I also sometimes need to add the FE80 class of, of IPv6 dress to get it working. Um, I don't quite know why, but um, that's what I found anyway. I think it might be something to do with v when I'm running my VPN, of course, the problem. Back to the Django development server, um, and we should be all good again. The evil hack of bootstrapping via Django database models verification is gone as should those risks have warned about of module import cycles and strange exceptions. What though if you want to use a real production grade WSGI server such as ModWSGI? In this example, I'm going to run through how to set this up using ModWSGI Express. And I, I know I've done this twice already in the last couple of days. Um, at least this time I won't make any mistakes because it's in the slides. Um, so if using, uh, so the first thing we do with that is we, we're going to run pip install ModWSGI. Um, this is an alternate now which you can do instead of the old path which you had to run configure and make separately. Now, if you're using Mac OS, that should install no problems. If you're on Linux, then you may first need to install the Apache development package for the specific variant of Linux you're running. Once installed, we can now test that package was installed correctly and that Apache, can start, that Apache will start up properly. For this, we run the modwiski express command and give it the start server command. Normally, we would provide an additional argument of the whiskey script file to use, but because we only want to do a test of the installation at this point, we're just going to leave that off. So in a separate window, we can now open up the browser on the URL for the instance of Apache we just started. And with that, we now get this helpful little splash, splash screen, and you know it's all working fine. Now, as I already mentioned, to run it with an actual whiskey application at this point, you can supply the path to the whiskey script file. Uh, you can also use the minus minus help option to get information on all the command line options in case you want to change the list and port, specify a directory full of static assets and so on. Um, you'll find documentation for it all on, on PyPy is the only place, PyPI is the only place you'll find uh, for mod WSGI Express at this point, so you can also look there. Now, because we are using Django though, rather than pointing ModWSGI Express direct at a, at a WSGI script file, it's better to integrate it into ModWSGI with Django itself. That way when we run ModWSGI Express, it will also know about the Django specific requirements for static files. What we therefore do is add ModWSGI server into the Django installed applications list of the Django settings file. Django does these days have the static files application <coughs> However, if using a WSGI server integrated with a real web server, such as the case with ModWSGI, it's be really much better to use that real web server. We therefore set up a location for the static files to reside and run the Django collect static management command to collect together all those static files from the different installed applications, including Django debug toolbar, um, and we'll get that. Whatever you do though, do not remove Django contrib static files from installed apps. This is because the Django debug toolbar code doesn't act want to trust and I know what I'm doing and will cause everything to fail if it does think, doesn't think that the static files will actually be served by Django contrib static files. I can't say I like that. Now finally, here's the cool part. To actually run modwiski with Django, we simply run the mod, run modwiski management command. This will automatically generate an Apache configuration for you for this instance. This will include mounting the Django application setting up static files and so on. 
Because we're in development environment here, we can even enable automatic code reloading for good measure, and ModWiski Express will worry about all those details of all the Apache configuration for you. The output from invoking the mod, run mod whiskey command will give the URL to then access the site as well as the location of the Apache configuration which was generated in case you want to poke around and learn from what I'm doing there with this automatically generated configuration. Uh, it also gives you the Apache error log in case anything goes wrong when using your application and you need to track down the details of any exceptions logged there. Most important for what this talk is about, uh, the Django, T Django debug toolbar will also now work because we've followed those explicit con configuration steps that uh, for Django debug tool while we went through. So what we learned from the explicit configuration steps required is that Django debug toolbar is dependent on a number of key things in, in order to work. These are a series of view hand, this, these are a bunch of static file assets, CS, HTML, CSS, JavaScript and images. It registers a series of view handlers which are used to produce data for each toolbar panel, which in turn potentially require page templates to render response. Finally, it requires the Django middleware to be installed. It is this last thing, the Django uh, middleware, which is the key to the Django debug toolbar working. It is the middleware which allows it to hook into the different phases of handling a request in Django. For the Django debug toolbar, it hooks into the process request, process view, and process response phases for Django request handling. This allows it to perform actions at the start of the request, prior to the target view handler being invoked to handle a request, and finally allows it to perform, perform actions at the end of the request, as well as actually manipulate the response returned for a request. Note that this is for any request, not just the request made against the Django debug toolbar's own view handlers. The part which is initially of most interest in the middleware occurs in the process response phase. It is in this phase where the toolbar itself is injected into the response that comes back for a request. Before that can be done though, it is necessary to first determine whether the page is in fact HTML and that it makes sense to actually insert anything. There is no point trying to insert the toolbar into images or plain text file. We also want to avoid compressed data or streamed responses. If it is okay to be modifying the response, then the rendered HTML corresponding to the toolbar itself will be injected into the original HTML response <coughs> for, the, for the request. This injection of the toolbar HTML is done just prior to the existing closing body tag. The combination of the HTML as well as the style sheets and Java code which, in turn, which it in turn loads, when rendered in the browser, results in the sidebar appearing alongside the content of the original request. As shown before, the sidebar under the time category will show how long the request took to be handled, or at least up until the time that the toolbar HTML was inserted into the response. When we click on the time category in the sidebar though, only then will the debug toolbar panel be displayed, with more detailed timing information related to the request. Although the sidebar itself came back with the original request, the panel displayed is the result of a separate AJAX request made as a result of clicking in that category in the toolbar. Given it is a separate request to get the additional data, where is the data stored and how is it identified? The answer is that any data generated from request is saved away at the time of the request. In the toolbar HTML that comes back with a response, it has a storage ID field, which identifies the item in the cache for the original request. When drilling down, a request is made with that storage ID along with the ID of the panel corresponding to the category selected on the sidebar, which should then display the data from the original request. Now we can't save away the full details on every request made, so any data stored in the cache must have a finite lifetime. By default, the number of requests for which data is retained is 10. This is actually quite a big limitation, as what it means is that the debug toolbar is not very useful when trying to use it on an application which has any traffic beyond that which you are manually creating with your browser. This is because any data on the request you're interested in would have been thrown away by the time you drill down to it. As well as potentially losing data if there are other users concurrently using the same web application, the data can be purged if you are working on a page which has a heavy JavaScript component, which makes additional AJAX requests after the initial page response has, has, has been returned. These AJAX requests are also a problem in themselves. This is because the Django debug toolbar only provides you the ability to debug the primary HTML request. 
There is no ability to get details on any of those subsequent AJAX requests made from that page. The limitation on AJAX requests is that the toolbar is displayed in line with the current request only. To better understand what I mean by this, it actually helps to look at how the debug toolbar for Pyramid Web Framework works in comparison to that of Django. In the Pyramid Debug toolbar, you do not get a sidebar for the current request. Instead, you only get an icon indicating that the debug toolbar is operating. When that icon is clicked on, it then goes off to a completely separate window. So what the Pyramid Debug Toolbar does is not show any details in line to the current request. Instead, you always access details of requests from a separate window, which shows a list of the last 20 requests. When clicking on the inline icon within the initial page response, it will push you across to the details of that specific request in the separate window. Important is that since you now see all recent requests, you can also see any separate AJAX requests or requests served by the web application for other assets associated with the page. So having jumped a look at Pyramid, let's look at the history of debug toolbars for Python. As I already said, as far as I know, it started out with the Django debug toolbar. This was summarily copied in creating the Flask debug toolbar. And from the Flask debug toolbar, we then had uh, separate implementations occur for Bottle, Web.py, and Pyramid. As far as I know, with the exception of Pyramid, they all simply copied the inline style of the Django debug toolbar, as only Pyramid branched out and tried to address the tracking of AJAX requests. The Pyramid debug toolbar was therefore an improvement, but in my mind, they all have one big failing. That is that they, all, they are all distinct implementations. That is, Django implementation is intrinsically wedded to Django middleware infrastructure with implementations of panels implemented as Django view handlers <coughs> using Django templates. Flask uses its own middleware in Jinja 2, and so on for the others, with each ported to their specific way of doing things. The opportunity missed here, as far as I'm concerned, is that there these, or all these different web frameworks at their lowest levels implement the WSGI specification. Yes, the debug toolbars do offer some panels which are framework specific, but the core functionality they implement can be implemented as a WSGI middleware. There, are therefore been, there has therefore been quite a lot of effort wasted in creating these separate implementations, whereas if it's done at the WSGI level, there could be one debug toolbar to rule them all. So imagine it for a moment. One debug toolbar that was best of breed. When someone enhanced it due to what they found when using a specific web framework, all other web frameworks could benefit as well. Now, wouldn't that be wonderful? Unfortunately, Python web communities have a tendency not to cooperate with each other. They all think the way that they do things is the best and only way, and they want to talk to each other. So since I think it's such a great idea, let's have a look at implementing the basic mechanism of debug toolbar code at the WSGI level using a WSGI middleware. In particular, let's look at how we can manage to inject the toolbar HTML code in the response for requests. If we work out how to do that, then we're well on our way to coming out of a WSGI level implementation of all this. This is where we can learn from the Django middleware code I showed earlier. And now, it may not be obvious, but there are a couple of key things going on here. The first is that the HTML code is being inserted just prior to the closing body tag. And the second is that the content length for the response is being updated. In other words, we eventually need to operate on the complete response in one go. This presents us with a bit of a problem. And that is that in WSGI applications, the, whiz the response doesn't need to come back as one byte string, but a sequence of byte strings. As far as inserting something at the end of the body, we could just look at each separate byte string until we find that closing body tag and then insert it. But the issue is that we also need to update the content length. And if we can't know the length of what is being inserted until it is inserted, we can't adjust the content length at that point, at the point that the headers are sent and still stream the response. Now we could buffer all the response content in the middle where, and then operate on the complete response contents and then send it on after adjusting the content length. Technically, though, you're not meant to do this in WSGI middleware. Plus, it would cause applications which slowly stream data over time to break, as nothing would be set until all the content was generated. The actual size of the response content could also be a problem if, for example, one was streaming a very large file that you couldn't fit in memory. If having to insert it at the end of body is such a problem, why are we inserting it at that point anyway? The reason is that part of what is being inserted consists of JavaScript code. And the wisdom is that this should always be inserted at the end of body so as not to delay page loading by doing it earlier in the page. That may well have been the case once upon a time, but are there now better ways of doing it which would allow us to insert it instead earlier in the response? 
With modern browsers, we can use today rather what we can do is rather than needing to defer things to the end of the body, we can instead load the JavaScript from the head element of the page, marking that it sh would, should be loaded asynchronously rather than in line to the request. By being asynchronous, we do not delay the loading of the remainder of the page. When the JavaScript is loaded, we then need to trigger an action to go back and modify the DOM for the loaded page to insert what we wanted there in the first place at the, at the end of the body. We have to be careful in doing this, though, as we likely need to ensure that the page has actually been completely loaded. What we can do, therefore, is trigger any action to modify the DOM off the document being ready in the JavaScript code we're loading. How does this help, though? The reason is that we no longer have to buffer up the complete response in order to be able to insert into the end of the body. At worst, we have to buffer up to the start of the body, but the amount we have to buffer is a lot less and so doesn't present an issue with memory. It is also highly unlikely, even with a streaming response, that the head element would be sent slowly in parts. Instead, any head would be sent in one go up front and we'd, we would only, it would only be the body which is sent out slowly. So we can handle insertion. What about the UI itself? The problem with existing toolbars is that the UI is intrinsically tied to the URL routing, request handler, and page template systems of those specific frameworks. My suggested solution for this is only to have a REST API served up by the Whiskey middleware for accessing any data stored about requests. The UI would then be a JavaScript interface rendered in the client. By using a REST API in the WSGI middleware to get access to data, we are then separated from the specifics of a particular web framework. So you thought in coming to this talk that you would learn about how debug toolbars work. Hopefully, in part, you have. But what I really wanted to pitch was the idea that our current debug toolbar implementations could do a big overhaul. In particular, there is a great opportunity to come up with a debug toolbar package which would work with any WSGI framework. So I think we can build a better ecosystem and build, make our job of debugging Python web applications a lot easier. So one thing I'd personally like to do is integrate into the debug toolbar features to allow to view additional performance monitoring data. As an example, and I, I tried to show this yesterday, uh, I implemented extra additional monitoring for, for ModWhiskey. Um, and, but this was dependent on the New Relic platform plugin system. Uh, now, all that, is free, all that is free to use. When I announced it on the mod WSU mailing list, I got zero people interested. And I know, because I get statistics from when it's used. So people object to it not being a, able to self-host these sorts of things. What I don't want to have to do, though, if I'm going to provide us a UI, is to provide a different UI for every different debug toolbar out there, if I'm going to go that path. Now, I've also been working on a side project related to the New Relic Python agent, uh, which I work on as my day job. Now, New Relic is a wonderful tool for web application performance monitoring, and you should really all be using it. What I would like to do, though, is bring some aspects of what we do in that uh, Python agent into a what I call local developer mode, integrated into a debug toolbar environment. So this is the idea that we, you wouldn't actually need to contact back to New Relic. So it's just going to keep some data locally and give you some of what we were able to track. So, Basically, we have a production-capable way of monitoring data here, so let's make it so you can use it in the development environment as well. So in considering this idea, though, there's actually a bit of a twist. And the problem of how to insert, insert HTML into responses, as I've described, is something that we've already solved in our Python agent, because we need to use that exact same technique for injecting JavaScript into pages in order to do end-user monitoring, which is monitoring it from the perspective of the user's browser. So the thought is, why not try and base a debug toolbar on what we've managed to do with the insertion of HTML in our own agent? Uh, we could even have a variant of the debug toolbar which you could use when using New Relic in production. So it's a bit of both worlds. You get it in your production. You can also get it in development as well. Now, there are no doubt other third-party tools which can be brought under this same umbrella. And, and Simon, yesterday and today, uh, has demonstrated the, the, what Eventbrite has been doing with TikiBar. This actually embodies many of the same qualities I want to achieve in pursuing this whole idea. This includes the idea I have that one could come up with a limited toolbar which works for production systems, as well as something that you can use in development. Tiki Bar is, though, again bound specifically to Django and also, at the moment, Eventbrite's own application infrastructure. And that is exactly what I don't want to see. So I don't know if I'll be allowed to make it available, because obviously we are trying to build a commercial product um, where I work as well. And they might say, no, you can't do that because you're giving stuff away. But what I really want to do is build it on this idea of a local developer mode for New Relic's Python agent. It would give you this subset of its functionality for use in a development environment, using our mechanism for HTML injection to implement that debug toolbar mechanism. 
Panels for this debug toolbar system could then be used to access New Relic's own data, as well as any other data that debug toolbars present which are framework specific. On top of that, I want that mini toolbar which we can deliver up safe information in the production environment as well. So my reasons for doing this is all because I hate to see all that wasted effort being done by different developers for each different web framework or in-house systems. This doesn't make a great deal of sense to me. So all very altruistic, but I will have to admit that there is a bit of selfish aspect to this as well. And, and that is that I do think that what we do at New Relic is awesome. Uh, and that the debug toolbar provides a way of putting New Relic in front of all you people in a local environment to get an idea of what it is we do, so you might actually consider us for using it in your production system as well. So certainly I would love it if you go and try New Relic, but if you are, aren't interested in that at least, if you, but if you are interested in ex improving on the existing web application debug toolbars, then do get in touch with me with your own thoughts, ideas and features. Thank you. Thank you.